In this video, we're going to look at um, determining spontaneity from what we call the free energy, or delta G. So to kind of get started, we're going to use some equations that we developed from uh, the second and third law of thermodynamics. And we know that for a spontaneous reaction, for a spontaneous reaction, uh, the following has to be true, that delta S has got to be greater than Q over T. And we know that for a reaction, so the Q of a reaction is equal to delta H. So we can substitute that in and say, well, then delta S has got to be greater than delta H over T. So if we subtract delta S from both sides, we get 0, because delta S minus delta S is 0, has got to be greater than delta H over T minus delta S. And then if we multiply both sides by t, we get 0 has to be laid, has to be let, has to be, I'm sorry, greater than delta H minus t delta S. So this is the classic equation that um, you probably remember from high school. Um, and this is what we, we base our understanding of Gibbs free energy off of. So in order for a reaction to be spontaneous, this must be true. So to be spontaneous, delta H minus T delta S must be a negative number, right? So in order for this to be true, zero has got to be greater than delta H minus T delta S. So what we do is we call this Gibbs free energy. So we call this equation the Gibbs free energy change. And we say that this delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. So when this, so we can use this then to predict spontaneity. So in terms of predicting spontaneity, um, we can make a little table here. So for delta G, we can have a negative, a zero, and a positive. So uh, in this case, just using those numbers, and we, we, we can put spontaneity on the right in this table, uh, we know that negative should be spontaneous, uh, and positive should be non-spontaneous. And then at zero, what do we do? What, what, what could it be if this is equal to zero? If it's not, if it's e in the binary sort of, sort of thought of non-spontaneous versus spontaneous, it's hard to interpret this. It turns out that at zero, that, the way to think about this is that it really has no preference for product or reactants. And when something has no preference for product or reactants, it can go in either direction. We call this equilibrium. So when this equation equals zero, is at equilibrium. Now, another way to think of the Gibbs free energy change is that it's a measure of how much work that can be done by the system. So in terms of uh, thinking of it in that context, um, we can think of things where in terms of in terms of negative positive and zero uh, and we think of work a system that has a negative delta G can do work a system that has a positive delta G needs work needs to have work done on it and then one that's at zero it can't do any work it's at equilibrium And then another thing that we can think about is what about a preference for um, reactants and products? So in this case, if it's negative and it's spontaneous, the reaction's going to want to go in the forward direction. So not only can it do work, but it's going to want to produce products. Oops, we just got to get back to our notes here. So uh, in this case, uh, the preference for product, this is going to want to produce products. Um, the positive one, this is not spontaneous in the forward direction. So the reverse direction must be spontaneous. So this is going to want to produce reactants. And then obviously, if it's at equilibrium, it's at equilibrium. So it's a, it'll have a fixed value for those, the concentrations will be fixed and they'll be going back and forth and they'll have an equilibrium mixture. Um, 
So that gives you a sense for uh, Gibbs free energy. Now we're going to talk about Gibbs free energy and standard states. With the Gibbs free energy change, um, we can have two different conditions. We can have one where we have delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. So this would just be a general equation for the free energy change given a delta H and a T delta S. Now, um, at standard conditions, though, we can assign this meaning, so we're at one atmosphere of pressure, 25 degrees Celsius, or for solutions, one molar concentration. We can assign this delta G naught is equal to delta H naught minus T delta S naught. Now, the reason why this is important is because um, these you can look up in a book. So these we can look up in a table. So this would allow you to figure out the delta G for any reaction. If you run that reaction under standard conditions, one atmosphere of pressure, 25 degrees Celsius, and one molar concentration um, of the solids, then what you can do is you can look up these delta H and delta S values, plug it into this equation, and get a value for delta G naught. Now, the reason why I put this up here is because um, we can, what we're going to see is down the road is we can actually, we can generally use these delta H and delta S naught um, values at different temperatures, as long as they don't change very much as a function of temperature, which is generally true. Um, so you can look at these things at different temperatures um, than 25 degrees Celsius. But if you're at 25 degrees Celsius, then you can use the values in the book. So here's our first example of how we can use uh, delta G is equal to uh, delta H naught minus T delta S naught. So in this question, it says calculate delta G naught for the reaction at 25 degrees Celsius and determine if the reaction is spontaneous. Use the data given below to calculate delta H and the data from table 18.1 to calculate delta S. So like I said, the equation, the primary equation that we have to use here is delta G naught is equal to delta H minus T delta S, and these both have naughts. So we need two things um, in this. We've got the temperature, so the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. We have to get delta H, and we have to get delta S. So for delta H, we're going to use uh, Hess's law, where we say that the delta H of a reaction is equal to the sum of the delta H of formation of the products minus the sum of the Oh, I'm sorry, and this is times n, times n times the delta H of formation of the reactants. So we're using Hess's law, same exact idea as, delta, as what we did for delta S just a few seconds ago, but we're going to do this for delta H, and that's going to give us the first part, and then we'll do the delta S part. So now a couple of things to remember about delta H. If you have an element in its standard state, the delta H is going to be zero. So I put on here for oxygen that it's explicitly zero. Now in the exam, you might not get that. So I'm trying to just refresh your memory of this because you have to remember that. So if we didn't give you oxygen because it's a element in its standard state, then you would just have to know that that, that one would be zero. So keep that in the back of your mind. So let's do the delta H part first. Um, so in this case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the delta H is gonna be, and we're gonna put our bracket for the reaction. Uh, so we'll, we'll start with our products. So we'll pull the number for uh, CO2, which is um, minus 393.5. Uh, and then we're going to add to that our H2O, which is 2 times minus 241.8. And I'm sorry, these should be kilojoules per mole for units. And this is 241.8 kilojoules per mole. Close brackets, and then we're going to subtract. And then our reactant, we're just, we just have one for the delta H. So this is going to be minus, in our brackets, uh, the CH4, which is negative 74.87 kilojoules per mole. And then we close bracket. So the, the delta H for this reaction is going to equal... Minus 802.2 kilojoules per mole. Now we can do the delta S. Uh, 
So the delta S, I know you don't have the table in front of you, so I'm just going to give you the values. Um, the delta S in this case is going to be uh, 213 joules per mole Kelvin. Uh, that is the value for CO2 if you were to look it up. Plus 2 times uh, 188.7, and I got this again from the table, joules per mole Kelvin. And then we subtract from this. And now here's the important thing. Oxygen does have an entropy term, um, even though it doesn't have an enthalpy term. So in brackets, we're going to put uh, minus, uh, 186.1 joules per mole Kelvin. Uh, 186.1 joules per mole Kelvin plus 2. This is for the oxygen of 205.0. Joules per mole Kelvin, and so we and we can close our bracket, and so our delta S naught in this case is going to equal minus five joules per mole Kelvin. So now we have our delta S and our delta H, and we can start to we can plug these into delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. However, we have to make sure that the units work out. When we, saw, when we worked this one out, the units were in kilojoules, and when we worked this one out, the units are in joules. So it's your choice of what you want to do. You can turn this into all joules, which is what I'm going to do, or you can turn it into all kilojoules. And then you just, you just have to make sure that whatever we, we ask you for, like in this case, it doesn't specify joules or kilojoules. Um, if we were to ask you for joules or kilojoules, you have to make sure it was in those units. In this case, you, you have your choice. So I'm going to convert the 802.2 kilojoules into joules. So we're going to get minus 802.2 times 10 to the third joules um, per mole. That's our delta H. And then we're going to subtract our temperature, which is 298 Kelvin. You have to make sure that you put the temperature in Kelvin because we're working with uh, absolute temperatures. And then we're going to multiply that by negative 5 joules per mole Kelvin. And so delta G naught in this case is going to equal minus eight hundred point seven kilojoules. So I, I guess I converted that back to kilojoules. So you get uh after you did the math and you got the joules, you could convert it back to kilojoules. So in the end, uh, this looks like this is going to be a spontaneous reaction because we get a negative, a large negative value. So the formation of CO2 and H2O is going to be preferred. This reaction is going to give almost entirely products because we have such a large uh, negative free energy.